Hello, everyone, and welcome to the League of Women Voters of Fairfield, Connecticut, and the Fairfield Museum and History Center Legislative Forum for 2021. My name is Lori Pastoriak, and I'm happy to welcome you uh, tonight to be able to offer uh, our community this mm -hmm. opportunity to hear from your legislators, from ourselves, and of course, the League of Women Voters of Fairfield, Connecticut. So the Fairfield Museum and History Center is located at 370 Beach Road in Fairfield, Connecticut. And our website is www.fairfieldhistory.org. We're looking forward to being able to partner on future events with the League of Women Voters of Fairfield. And we're really excited to be able to bring you this program tonight. We hope you enjoy and thank you very much. Good evening. On behalf of the League of Women Voters of Fairfield, I'd like to welcome you to our first 2021 Legislative Forum. Our thanks to the Fairfield Museum and History Center for being such a great partner and for offering the technology that makes this presentation possible. Democracy is not a spectator sport. It requires active and informed participation. Forums like this educate both citizens and legislators about the issues that concern Fairfield. I'd like to thank our state representatives, Laura Devlin, Jennifer Leeper, Kristen mccarthy Vahey, and our state senator, T Tony Wong, for joining us tonight. I, we always appreciate that you take time out of what we know is very busy schedules for all of you. Um, we'll begin the forum with, the, with each legislator having two minutes to speak about their priorities, projects, issues, whatever you'd like, it's your two minutes. Then I'll ask one question based on League of Women Voter priorities, followed by questions from the public, which we received via email. They've been written up and drawn randomly. I do want to thank everybody for all the questions. They were great. We, we had a really good response and some really interesting questions. So, so let's begin the opening remarks. And uh, for the next two minutes, Laura, the floor is yours. Thank you, Bryce. And I really want to offer my thanks to the League of Women Voters and to the Fairfield Museum for hosting this forum tonight. I look forward to the time that we can be back in the museum and doing these forums uh, live. You know, one of the things that Bryce said is, you know, this is all about democracy and democracy is about being engaged. And um, this is such a great opportunity for uh, us to hear from you and for you to hear from us as well about what is happening in your state capital, uh, because there are some big issues being discussed and it's really important. Um, and sometimes it can be overlooked to focus on what's happening out of Hartford. Uh, so I am Laura Devlin. I am proud to represent the 134th district, which includes Fairfield and Trumbull. I am serving in my fourth term in the legislature and I serve on the Finance Revenue and Bonding Committee, the Transportation Committee, the Transportation Bonding Subcommittee, the Education Committee, the Legislative Management Committee, and I am also a Deputy Republican leader within our caucus. Um, you know, this session is very different, obviously, as we are uh, dealing with hopefully coming out of the pandemic, but so many things are remote and done via Zoom, which we hope can provide an opportunity for more engagement but it also runs the risk of shutting out voices as well. Uh, so it's really something that we need to balance. And our state is doing a great job of recovering um, from the pandemic. And I hope that everybody is safe and healthy. And if you're eligible for the vaccine, you are taking advantage of that. Um, but we do have a long way to go. Uh, our state did never, never did recover from the 2008 economic recession. And we've got a lot of work to be able to move forward to come safely and with everybody healthy out of the pandemic and really restart Connecticut to get people back to work and back to school, focusing on health and safety, um, providing a government that is transparent and that works for you and also supporting our businesses. So those are my priorities going into this session and I look forward to the conversation tonight. Thank you, Laura. Uh, Jen, you're up next. Great. You got the floor. 
Thank you so much, Bryce, and thank you so much to the League for hosting this event. I am Representative Jennifer Leeper, serving the 132nd, representing Fairfield and Southport. And as a first year legislator in the midst of a pandemic, I'm excited to have this opportunity to publicly answer questions from our community. Like everything this year, this session has been unique. And I am working hard to learn as quickly as I can and communicate with our community regularly about the work I'm doing up in Hartford and answer your questions. I serve on the Aging Committee, the Commerce Committee, and Education Committee. And I would say that these three populations, our seniors, our small businesses, and our students have been hardest hit by COVID. So a great deal of the work is in helping these populations through this crisis. And I'm thrilled that um, it was just announced that our teachers and childcare providers will be eligible for the COVID vaccine beginning on March 1st. I think that's very exciting news and, and welcome to all parents who have kids in school like myself. Um, and I'm also serving as the co-chair of the Main Street Working Group. It's a group that focuses on investing in and revitalizing Connecticut's main streets and therefore business districts and really the hearts of our communities. So the aging committee's priorities are of course, protecting seniors in congregate settings um, and battling the isolation our seniors were facing in these settings by ensuring they have easier access to their loved ones. And then also deterring age discrimination in hiring practices uh, among many other things. And in the Commerce Committee, we're doing a lot of work to protect our small businesses, uh, better invest in the arts and tourism, and creating a workforce development pipeline for individuals with intellectual disabilities and supporting the work of our advanced, advanced manufacturing sector. And I'm personally particularly excited about the work I'm doing on a bill HB 6512 to make it easier for trade professionals from industry particularly in manufacturing, to enter the classroom for our technical high schools. We have a technical high school system in Connecticut that is a national leader. It serves over 11,000 students every year in Connecticut. And advanced manufacturing will need 17,000 new workers in the coming years. And the industry is telling us that they don't have the workforce to meet the demand for this sector. So it's been prioritized by the governor's Workforce Development Council and a big piece of that is getting more professionals into the classroom to reach more students. These careers are pathways to the middle class for Connecticut's youth and Thank advanced you. manufacturing salary averages $98,000 a year. So it really is a win-win. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Kristen, please. You're muted, Kristen. Well, thank you, Bryce. I think that's the line of the year. I appreciate you as the League of Women Voters and the Fairfield Museum and History Center for having us and for hosting us over so many years. Um, it's been a privilege and a pleasure to serve as a state representative for the past three terms. This is my fourth term representing the 133rd district. And having previously been a selectman and RTM member in Fairfield, I was first a lead member. Uh, I served this term on the transportation, government administration, elections, and planning and development committee in the role of house co-chair. And I also serve as the co-chair of our coastal caucus. Um, before I talk specifically about some of the things that we're doing in each of the committees, as well as some of the bills that I've had the pleasure of working on with Fairfielders, I just wanna say one of the most important things to me this session and beyond is that not only do we remember that democracy is not a spectator sport, but that we engage in those um, good sportsmanlike behaviors and the practices of civility, that we assure that we're shifting our norms to a place where we have productive civil dialogue. And I think that's really important today. Um, GAE, which is the Government Administrations and Elections Committee is actually meeting now. I have another screen up next to me we are hearing today two bills or resolutions to expand no excuse absentee balloting and to allow for early voting in our state. These are foundational and are huge priorities of mine and of the committee and our secretary of the state. 
And today we have 134 people signed up. So certainly those folks are not uh, seeing this as a um, on the sidelines. And I also want to share briefly in transportation. We're working on issues around pedestrian safety. That's one of the priorities this session, which is a thrill. We all are pedestrians at some point in our transportation journeys. This is an issue I've been working on for many years in our community together with our Fairfield Bike and Pedestrian Community. Our planning and development committee is focuses on the work around zoning. And I forgive me, I'm hearing some feedback, so I'm just gonna keep going. Um, we will be pardon me, Bryce. Your time is just about up. Okay. And so zoning and property tax issues and municipal issues issues lots more conversation we'll talk about during the course of our conversation tonight thanks so much thank you tony welcome thank you bryce great to see you always and uh thank you for the league uh you you do such a great job in being engaged in the electoral process um i am senator tony huang i am the deputy sending my senate minority leader i am serving my actually seventh term in the General Assembly, um, six years as a state rep and six years um, as a uh, USA senator. Um, uh, that being said, the, the first committee I'm ranking on is in public health, which will have uh, cognizance over health care and, and issues related to that. So first and foremost, we are involved in the COVID-19 pandemic uh, solutions. Uh, we're working on vaccine distribution. And I'm happy to report that uh, the governor just announced that uh, March 1st, uh, individuals 55 and over can start registering for the vaccine, which is wonderful news. Um, that said, I am also ranking member on planning and development uh, with my fellow co-chair, uh, my chair, uh, Representative McCarthy Vehi, and that committee has hot cognizance of interaction with municipal issues, but also on zoning and land use issues. Uh, the third ranking role that I have is on the insurance and real estate committee, where we look to kind of contain cost uh, and control healthcare insurance, um, inflated costs. And we're working to try to address solutions. There may be different ways of going about it, but my hope is that we are working together to try to contain health insurance costs. The fourth committee that I serve on is in the finance, revenue, and bonding which looks at um, uh, revenue sources to be able to facilitate all the initiatives and, and uh, um, the costs that we need to run our government. Um, I, I think the two critical issues outside of those committee works that we do has to be on the focus of the post-COVID-19 impact on our economics, our small businesses, and, and the, really the, the, the changing landscape of how our economic uh, uh, workforce will interact in this post-COVID environment. Uh, another critical issue that I'm very proud to, to work collaboratively on and bipartisanly on is trying to get our students and our teachers back into school. So okay. I am incredibly thrilled that the governor has announced that our teachers uh, and our school staff will be considered essential workers and be eligible for the vaccine on March 1st as well. And, and at the end of the day, I think it is absolutely critical to get our kids and our teachers safely back into school. They've Thank missed too much. Thank you very much. I appreciate that, all your comments. Um, I'm gonna start with the question from the league. And Tony, your sound did get better, by the way, as whatever happened seemed to improve, so thank you. Um, the League of Women Voters encourages efforts to maximize voter participation. It supports early voting and measures which assure that absentee ballot privileges are available to all electors for any or no reason. 44 states and Washington, D.C. offer early in-person voting. In two-thirds of all states, qualified voters may vote absentee without any excuse. 35% of all votes cast in Connecticut for the November 2020 election were by absentee ballot. Voter turnout was 79.7%, the highest ever recorded. In a recent Connecticut poll by Secure Democracy, 73% of people said they want no excuse absentee balance, ballots and 79% support early in-person voting. Please state how you, how you stand on these issues and how you would vote. 
Thank you. And um, it would not be a League of Women's Voter without the issue of no excuse, absentee ballot, and early voting. Uh, I am happy to say that uh, for the past number of years, I have been very supportive and voted for uh, no excuse, absentee ballot. Although the complexity is is given to the fact that we need to have a constitutional amendment change. So it would have to pass out of the legislature this year with a two-thirds majority of both houses and then go for a referendum vote uh, on the ballot box. So I, I have always been and recognized that the time has changed for the convenience, but also increased participation. We have learned in this past election cycle that uh, it, voter engagement is a true reflection of an engaged democracy. Uh, that being said, the second component of what you raise is uh, early voting. And that resolution that is before the GAE committee is a little bit different than just simply early voting. I believe the resolution, as I read it, looks at multiple uh, methodologies and, and, and processes in which voting could take place. And the only approval is not through a two-thirds majority in both houses or a, a, a referendum vote. It is by the majority of the party uh, or the vote in the House and the Senate. So it's a much lower threshold of standard. So the, 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 the question of early voting is one I think that is going to be begging a lot more detail, but I'm eager to learn more about it. The more that we can have voters engage in the de democratic process, I believe absolutely it's better democracy. So if I, if I can jump, may I jump in? Yes. I was just going to say, you're the, it appears you're not muted, so that's a good thing. Thank you. That's good. I remembered this time. Well, <laughs> I can tell you clearly, unequivocally, and wholeheartedly, I fully support both of the resolutions that are before the, the GAE committee right now as we speak. Uh, I've co-sponsored both of them, and I've been a champion of these issues since I moved to Connecticut almost 20 years ago from a state, Washington, um, where I had access to a no excuse absentee ballot. And the two resolutions differ in this way to just put a little bit of a finer point on what Senator Wong said. The early voting initiative or the resolution was before the last General Assembly. And it was passed by that body with a simple majority. As a result, if it passes this session or this legislature with a simple majority, it's eligible to be on the ballot before voters in November 2022. No excuse absentee balloting, this is the first time that we've seen it. And that has to pass the legislature with a 75% vote in order to get on the 2022 ballot. We can't wait. 79% of people are interested in early voting and 73% no excuse. That's about what we need to get from the legislature to be able to put that no excuse absentee balloting on the ballot for the voters to then decide, do we want to change our constitution? It then goes back to the legislature to change our statute and to address those specific questions around how we do early voting and a lot of other things that we really need to do to modernize, safeguard, and update our voting system. But I do want to say one more thing Thank you to our amazing town clerk here in town, Betsy Brown, to our registrars of voters and to all the poll workers who really allowed us to vote in such large numbers via absentee ballot. Jennifer, I see that you're unmuted, so you're next. <laughs> Thank Happy you. to add on. I am definitely supportive of both no excuse absentee voting and early voting and just a few points on that. My understanding is that by allowing early voting, it prevents our local town clerks from sort of getting overrun like they were this year with all of the ballots coming in on the same day. And also we've now made the investments in the infrastructure to handle our ballots securely for um, absentee ballot returns, which I think is great. And I would hate to see that investment go to waste. And then also I co-introduced with all of the freshman Democrats this year, automatic voter registration, because I think we should be doing whatever we can to promote our civic duty and make it as easy as possible for, for people to vote. And then lastly, I'll just add the reminder that vote uh, voting is locally administered. And I know when I would tell people that at the doors this fall, they were very surprised because there's a lot of fear that Hartford is, or Washington in this case, 
was going to interfere with their ballot. And that's just not the case. The ballots are handled here as Representative McCarthy Vahey said by um, our local town clerk, Betsy Brown. And we also had a really unique opportunity to do the largest data cleaning we've ever had because of all the absentee ballot applications that were sent to people's homes. And if they got returned, that's an opportunity for our local town clerks to, to clear the data and clean the data um, and their local roles. Thank you. Laura, there you go. Last but not least, sorry. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm happy to weigh in on this as well. I do believe that anybody who is eligible to vote should have the difficult thing. Election day has always been a source of pride in our country and it has always been you know, sort of an event. Um, I think that uh, at what we saw during the pandemic that uh, we did expand, no excuse, essentially absentee balloting. And it's something that I promoted strongly during the past election uh, to what Rep Leeper was saying regarding people being concerned about Hartford meddling. It's because in the primaries, Hartford did, and it didn't work well at all. I think what gave people confidence is that ballots were handled locally in the town of Fairfield where we have very safe and secure procedures. I think the devil's always gonna be in the details, right? And I hope that the Secretary of State is taking this opportunity to put in the infrastructure and the processes and the resources to be able to manage this in a very smooth way. So I'm, I am supportive of no excuse absentee, especially in this area, maybe less so with commuters now, there's a little less commuting, but there's always been an issue with people going into New York, um, which is why we'd see the long lines at 6 a.m. for them to hop on the trains. Early voting, you know, I've, I've got to check that one out. I know there is support for that issue, but I do recall in a not too long ago election where people wanted to get their vote back and they couldn't. Um, but you certainly could with an absentee ballot. So I think it's something absolutely I'm open-minded to, but I look forward to seeing how things move after today's lengthy hearing in the GAE committee. Thank you. Can I just respond yes. to one point? That Hartford meddled in the sense that they mailed out all of those applications and the ballots, but our past ballots were still handled locally by our town clerk and not by Hartford. So I don't want any misconceptions that Hartford is meddling with people's votes. And I agree there were lots of bumps in, in the mailing process. Um, and I hope that a lot of lessons and best practices were, were learned through that. And I would follow along that line. And, and uh, I know Representative Devlin had served as the ranking uh, minority leader in GAE, as I did as well for four years. So we're very aware of it. it it's interesting. Um, and, and invariably, you have a full panel of people who support it. But you also have individuals that I need to note that raises concern about security. And in fact, you need to look one town over in Bridgeport, where a Democratic senator actually raised a bill in her concern for potential fraud and security in the primary process, see? So I think most importantly, as we support this, that we need to be vigilant and ensure that all safety measures are in, involved and engaged. And so that one person, one vote is protected. But absolutely, I think we are ready as a, a state and as a society to move forward with, with no excuse absentee voting. But we have to be careful and we have to be vigilant in ensuring that these votes are are protected. And, and you know, I think devil's in the detail. And, and, and I'm glad to hear that the entire delegation is supportive of no excuse absentee voting. But I want to throw caution the fact that we need to proceed carefully and we need to proceed in protecting people's safety and rights. And, you know, Bryce, if I just could, I appreciate the senator, you know, raising that. Also having served as the head moderator for elections within the town of Fairfield, it's always easy to say, yes, let's do this. Yes, let's do that. There is a tremendous amount that goes into organizing, planning, executing uh, safe, sound and secure elections. And, and really, you know, there's lots of ideas that sound good, um, but we need to ensure that we're also able to implement. And may I just yes. one more clarity? The resolution. <laughs> <that's>, <laughs> though this this is foundational. It's foundational to our democracy. But to clarify the resolutions that are before the committee now, 
are simply to allow the constitutional amendments to go on the ballot for all the voters of the state. And then from there, and hopefully with the time, there can be further planning, but I just wanna make sure that everyone's clear about what exactly those resolutions are. Thank you. We're gonna to move to the questions from the general public. And I have to say, I'm, I'm very impressed. Um, I put them all random, except for this first one, because four people asked the question. And I'm gonna give names, everybody's names here. So, and if I mispronounce your name, please forgive me, I'm terrible. Eric Treshuk, Treshuk, Amy Watson, Wendy Mouchette, and Jacqueline Page all asked, how do you recommend increasing the town of Fairfield's affordable housing from 2.47% of total housing stock to something closer to the state recommended 10%? How do you want Jen, to wanna start with you? We'll go up to the corner. Sure, I'm, I'm happy to start. So I have spent an absolutely tremendous amount of time researching and getting up to speed on affordable housing and specifically 830G as it is particularly relevant in our community. And I had been so hopeful to propose a bill um, this session around allowing for the issuing of credits to communities for uh, the acceptance of open choice students into our schools to help us have one more tool sort of in our bucket to both create opportunity zones and inclusive community and reach that moratorium. And when our community reaches a moratorium, that really gives us a lot more um, control over the development happening in our community. I was informed that um, after the 2017 amendment, there was sort of an informal gentleman's agreement that there'd be a five-year pause on um, amending that law. So I am working with the vice chair on the housing committee now to try to have a hearing so that we can study the impact of 830G and how effective or not it has been um, on achieving its goals so that we can be ready to go next year with some meaningful um, progress. And in terms of actually achieving more affordable housing in places the community wants it here in Fairfield, I actually think we could look to our neighbor Westport as a pretty good example. They have as a town planning and zoning commission really taken ownership over that planning piece and identified opportunity zones where they would like to channel development, a lot like what Fairfield did with our Commerce, Commerce Drive development. Um, I have found a link of all sorts of um, unutilized mill facilities in our town that maybe could be prioritized for this type of development, P places that we could breathe new life into, open up, because we do have a housing crisis here in Connecticut. And I do think that we have, an we have an obligation to be a better neighbor and allow people to have the social mobility that healthy and safe housing um, gives. And, and we just need to do a better and hopefully more proactive job of, of locating those sites. Okay, uh, Kristen, do you wanna jump in? And mind you, with these questions, not everybody, if you don't have a lot to say or whatever, you're not, you're not demanded to answer, but everybody, if you'd like the opportunity, you may, certainly, okay. Grace, thank you. And the fact that four people have raised the question just speaks to what a significant issue it is um, for us here in Fairfield and for our region. Um, and certainly, you know, as the, the region goes, it, it certainly impacts us as well. Just to, this is a great opportunity for me to clarify for folks, planning and development has cognizance over zoning, which of course is intimately tied to housing, zoning and land use. There's a separate housing committee that generally hears those 830G laws, um, as Jen talked about in working with the vice chair. And, you know, how do we get to that 10%? You know, obviously we talk about 10% a lot because of 830G, which really is a blunt instrument and has uh, created some struggles and problems here in our community. But the bigger question is how do we develop a diverse housing stock in our community? so that we can have our seniors able to stay in the community, so that we can have our millennials able to return, or actually now more than half of them are living at home, but they can have an option to remain in the community here. That when people need or want to downsize, or that we welcome 
other people into the community. Uh, I'm hoping that we can see Connecticut on a growth trajectory into the future. And how do we do that? Not by one simple single solution. It's going to have to be many things over many years because it's taken many years for us to get here. So one of the things that's been really exciting is to see some of the work of the Fairfield Senior Advocates that's happened here locally about accessory dwelling units. And this is happening actually all over the country, particularly in places like New England where we have an aging population where there's a move for the ADUs as we call them. That's one of the things we're gonna be talking about in our committee this year for the state. How do we help support that? But again, that's there are certain and simple tools, not, not that simple. We have an affordable housing committee here in Fairfield. We have an economic development director, Mark Barnhart, and many people who are going to have to continue to work together to be proactive, as Rep. Leeper said, on the planning side. I always say, in fact, Senator Wong and I earlier today were talking about a bill related to alternates for planning and zoning commissions. And here in Fairfield, we have a combined uh, T, P, and Z, so planning and zoning. And a lot of times, because we're fortunate to have, you know, a lot of things happening in our community, the zoning side tends to take precedence. We definitely need to continue to work on the planning side. I was happy a few years ago to be able to secure a planning grant. We're looking at development around our transit centers. And now our town is going through the plan of conservation and development conversation. And how do we talk together about where those places in town make sense for development, not just of affordable housing, but again, for a diverse housing stock. And I know I'm, I've talked too much, but there's, there's a lot to say about this, but I'll, I'll leave it there for now. Before um, Tony hops in, uh, and Kristen, I'm glad that you gave a shout out for the Affordable Housing Committee in town because they have done a tremendous amount of work. Um, you know, there are thousands of apartments that are coming online and in a very near term within the town of Fairfield. Um, a, one new development that just uh, offered applications or went open for applications is right by the Fairfield train station um, on Unqua Road. Uh, in addition, in 2018, the town established the Housing Trust Fund, which collects a fee um, from developers, and then that enables them to also invest in affordable housing. But I think diversification of housing stock is really important. I've shared with many when I moved here when I was in my 20s to buy a home because I was transferred in from a employment in New York City and chose Connecticut over New York or New Jersey or Long Island, which are other choices for people to go that work in Manhattan. Uh, it was really difficult to find anything except for single family homes. And it wasn't exactly what I desired. But I think that diversification is important. I think what we have to be careful of is that uh, is mandating uh, towns to do certain things out of Hartford as opposed to communities doing what's right for their community. And I think we have some really good things in place and I'm sure our good Senator is gonna wanna talk more about this. Well, I, I thank you, Laura. And uh, I am most excited about the opportunity that Fairfield will have two legislators actively engaged in this, myself, and Representative McCarthy Vahey in talking about zoning and, and sustainable housing. Uh, no doubt, affordable, accessible, and, and, and sustainable housing is a crisis in the state of Connecticut. But it doesn't just exist in our suburbs. It exists in our cities and exec it exists in our rural settings. That being said, I, I really believe that in order for it to be truly successful, you need a collaboration between neighborhoods, local government, state, and federal. You can't do it by one side telling the other. And, and I think the fundamental debate that we have right now uh, without, without getting into the weeds, as Bryce said, is the fact that we are looking at the possibility in this session of a state mandated policy versus local control and home rule. It's simple as that. We talk about the incredible caliber of volunteers that serve in our affordable housing task force, as well as our planning and zoning board. They have made a very conscious effort to, to 
increase our housing stock, to be able to manage growth in our community. And, and the other thing I will add to this as we continue in this conversation, we believe we need to have solution. And I know Representative Leeper mentioned about Westport, which I also happen to represent. And I was instrumental in working with the Affordable Housing Task Force, as well as the Planning and Zoning Board in Westport, as well as town leaders, to look at a parcel of State Department of Transportation property that was near walking area, transit-oriented area. We were able, and we are right now, right now looking to get a parcel of that land conveyed from the DOT to be able to build nearly 40 units of high quality housing for a diverse housing stock and not just single uh, rooms, but, but family oriented. What it is important to note is it is a complete collaboration between the neighborhood which supported this project as well as a town leader and state government. That is the model that we should emulate, not the idea of the state mandating down to the local municipality. That is a fundamental debate that we're going to have. We need to have solutions, but ultimately the solution can't be the state with a hammer telling our local municipalities and personal property owners that they have no control over their properties. So it, it is a absolutely essential debate that we'll have in this legislative session, but it's one that I'm eager to have. And I'm, again, I'm going to repeat, we're going to have two legislators from Fairfield that will be actively engaged in this conversation. So how lucky is the people of Fairfield to be able to get direct on contact in these point of conversations? So I'm very excited about these future conversations moving forward. And Bryce, if I may just add one piece to, and Senator Wong and I, I think are gonna have a lot of conversations like this in the legislative session this year, but there are a number of proposals that are gonna be before the Planning and um, Development Committee and they're not all about the, you know, trying to get rid of local input and local impact. Um, there are a lot of different conversations that will happen, and I invite people to engage. I think, to Senator Wong's point, I'd like to see us spend as much energy and invest as much in getting to those solutions as we do in talking about what doesn't work. And understandably, and I've talked about this before, home is where you live. Home is so deeply personal. And when we talk about it, it can really, you know, when we think about what may or may not happen, um, it really can be daunting and pretty upsetting. But I think we as Fairfielders, I want us to think about not only our homeowners and property owners, but also the folks who may be renting in our communities. In Fairfield County, you know, a third plus of the population rents too. So I want to broaden that conversation and recognize that you know, I don't want us to spend all of our time talking about home rule versus state mandates because there's there are a lot of nuances and pieces to that conversation that I look forward to having. Absolutely. And, and if I may also add that it's important to note, uh, in representing Fairfield and Westport, I have great pride in the community and the history of these communities. And so one of the most important themes that may be arising that I have great respect and consideration for is the issue of racial justice and social justice. And, and when it is parlayed into the housing and, and, and housing diversity conversation, I will share with you that in Westport and Fairfield, to use that moniker unfairly against that community is, is something I want to clearly point out. People need to understand that Westport and Fairfield had one of the first homeless shelters in all of Connecticut, uh, with us, Operation Hope, and in Westport, homes, of the, homes with Hope. The bottom line is, when you look at the moratorium that we are unable to meet, we need to know that the 830G statute does not count toward the moratorium for any affordable, de-restricted affordable housing that occurs after 1990. We have Parish Court, which was set up by the community. We have Sullivan McKinney. We in the town of Fairfield should be incredibly proud of the consideration that we have for affordable and diverse housing. We need to get better. We need to continue work toward that. But I, I need to point out, uh, for me as a Fairfield resident, I have great pride to know that uh, Fairfield has always stood out and stood up for the people in need. All right, well, we have a lot of questions and I think that you'll find that some of those loop back to this topic, um, but let's move on to the next one. This is from David Skog. Regarding HB 6424, 
race, ethnicity, and language data collection in the healthcare system. This bill will provide standard uniform data collection to illuminate demographic healthcare trends and racial inequalities across the state. This data can be used to provide targeted interventions to improve healthcare and help find solutions to the healthcare disparities we face in Connecticut. Please tell us how you stand on this proposed legislation. Bryce, would you read the bill number one more time? Sure. You don't have a memory. 6424. So, and I'll just make a couple of comments and I'll be yeah. honest. I have not read that bill in detail, but I did participate in a call with Connect that our good Reverend Spollett was also a part of. And one of the issues that we talked about was this legislation. Um, and I don't think it had a bill number at that time, or at least um, not something that I that I had. And in concept, it makes total sense. And I think what it will also do is provide some consistency, the way information is gathered, if I understand it correctly. So again, right, we talk about ideas that make sense. Uh, it totally does. Um, and I hope that when we talk about devil in the details, this nothing that would prevent this. Um, but it sounds totally uh, like a common sense move to me from a from a legislative proposal standpoint. I'm happy to add just two cents. I, I haven't gone um, in a deep dive, but I was also a part of that connect conversation and have had a couple other conversations since then. And as um, a former data analyst, I typically believe it's hard to measure a problem if you don't have good data around it. So this can help us. And I think especially with COVID, we know certain populations have been hit harder than others. And we know sort of anecdotally, and we know by just experiencing it, but we don't know the magnitude of it. And we can't know that effectively without meaningful data around it. And we know that it's not just COVID. Um, COVID has really shown a spotlight on certain communities having more um, pre-existing conditions and there are other wide health disparities that that this access to this type of data can help us better understand and better address and better um, target resources to to solve that's the that's the ultimate goal to solve these types of health disparities um this is an initiative that is uh initiated by the office health of health strategies uh, it appeared in the public health committee in which we uh, vetted it. Um, I, I completely agree. In, in this day of COVID, for us to get complete data for underrepresented groups, uh, racial minorities, and and to be able to delve in and, 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 and look at some particular symptomatic sources of prevention and data is absolutely essential. But I'm going to give you the flip side, and that's been raised, is the fact that when you collect data and you micromanage the data points uh, of racial minority groups, one such opposition that arose in the past years is when they decategorize Asian Americans, Asian Pacific Americans, unlike uh, African Americans, as well as Latino and Caucasians, there was an intent to de-aggregate, disaggregate data of Asian Pacific to break down by Filipino, by Laotians, by Mao, uh, you know, Hmong, as well as Chinese, Japanese, and Korean. So the Asian Pacific American group said, why are you looking to disaggregate one particular group versus a Caucasian group that may have Irish, Italian, German? It seems to be an inconsistency in regards to your data collection. So that has been one of the critical challenges the best of intentions, but again, as we said earlier, the devil's in the details, and you gotta be very sensitive that are you collecting data, not just for the premise of healthcare, when it possibly could be used for other means. And one of the uproars that caused of that was the, the purported lawsuit with Harvard and Yale in using disaggregate data of Asian Pacific Americans in their emissions decision process. So when you look at collecting data, well-intentioned, but we have to be very conscious of subgroups and their sensitivity of those data being used against them. So yes, I know that bill very well. And I think the, the, the premise is we need to get that data, but how do we craft it to respect people's privacy and, and data considerations? Kristen? 
Yes, Bryce, thank you so much. And thank you to, I believe it was David who asked the question. It's a really great question. I appreciate Senator Wong bringing up a bill. I believe it was actually in the Education Committee. So I remember the testimony, um, which was really, really interesting and elicited a lot of feedback from different groups within the Asian American community. And it's true, whenever we talk about race, um, data around race, or if we're talking about racism, um, it, it's really hard. These are really difficult conversations. And one of the real benefits to data is it helps us to kind of step back and take a look as opposed to maybe what some of our feelings or thoughts, it's that you know hard evidence versus some of the anecdotal. I've spent some time recently with the folks at the Connecticut Data Collaborative, and it's been some really fascinating conversations. When I think about this bill, I think how absolutely critical it is. What has happened during COVID? What we know is that the death rates for African Americans in our state have just been exponentially higher during COVID for those of us and for people like me who look like me, who are white. And that's really concerning. What we also know is that our Department of Public Health doesn't have um, some of the ability to collect some of the data as we're distributing the vaccines. And we're seeing that, again, Caucasians are, um, there's a higher uptake at a higher percentage than we are of the population. And I say we because I'm white. Um, I think it's really critical that we collect this data and use it properly and respectfully at the same time that we have the very real and difficult conversations like our Racial Equity and Justice Task Force here in Fairfield is having and others around the state to talk about what the data means and then what we can do to help make sure that a black or brown mom isn't much more likely to die in childbirth than a white mom like me. So we've got to address these issues um, and we have to continue to have these open conversations and hopefully remain open to one another as we do that. It's hard. Thank you. All right, the next question is from Tom Flynn. Based on what you know about the wording of this year's clean slate bill, what do you like and what are your concerns? So no easy questions this go around. <laughs> so I'm happy to start with that one too. Uh, I have not seen the legislation and it only comes to me in a follow-up conversation again that I had with Connect. And I'll tell you my initial reaction was I wasn't favorable and we had a really great discussion and I really believe it's something that I may support. Again, right, we've gotta see how it's crafted and that what was shared with me is that individuals who have been released from prison over a certain period of time, given whatever the category is, right, of in terms of a felony, et cetera, um, if, uh, if they had sort of a clean slate, they were far less, to, far more likely to be a productive member of the society and far less to be reincarcerated. And to me, what's important is that, listen, the reason that you know somebody goes to jail, the reason that some of these things are in place is that you do really bad stuff, there's gonna be really bad consequences. And the consequences are intended to stop you from taking that action. But I think there may be categories um, and based on some data that they had shared with me, I'm really intrigued by this. So I'm still learning, but very open-minded to the concept we're going in, I, I was not. Can I jump in and follow up? Sure. Um, I love the fact that Representative Devlin spoke of it that way. When you asked the question, Bryce, I thought right away, Tom Flynn, which Tom Flynn? <laughs> Tom Flynn, our selectman, is of course a leader in town, but as soon as he said clean slate, I knew that it was the other Tom Flynn. And Senator Wong is laughing. And why am I emphasizing this? Is because this is where using your voice and reaching out and educating us as legislators really, really matters. I have um, made an appointment with Reverend Spallett today. So I'll have my conversation coming up. But Tom's done an amazing job 
Um, and because of what I've learned from Tom and other Clean Slate advocates, I will absolutely be supporting this. To answer your question though, Tom, I need to talk to you because I don't know what the latest language is. And I need to talk to the Judiciary Committee Chair as well. But I also will just say Connect, um, which is Congregations Organized for a New Connecticut, has a number of Fairfield residents involved and they do a tremendous job. If you want to learn how to organize, talk to Connect because they'll teach you how to do it really well. I'm happy just to add two cents. I haven't um, read the full proposed legislation to date, so I'm in a similar place as Rep Devlin, um, and I like to read things for detail. I agree wholeheartedly with my colleagues that the devil is always in the details. Um, but I do think it really makes us reconsider our criminal justice system. Is it here to punish people into perpetuity or is it here to help rehabilitate people so that they can return to society and be functioning, contributing members of their community and, and return to fulfilling lives? And I think that's the goal. So wherever there's opportunities for us to help facilitate that goal, I'm very, very much in support of that. Well, I, I, I'm really happy to, to hear Tom Flynn's uh, name because obviously the Flynn's are remarkable League of Women Voter Advocates. But you know what? It could be the Tom Flynn that is our first electman because we really shouldn't be judging labels. And, and people could surprise because different viewpoints, different perspectives uh, is really what we continue to learn, as Representative Devlin just demonstrated, that we are open to learning, open to exchange of ideas. And the reason I say that is I have been fully supportive of the clean slate to a degree. And, and it's important to recognize that, that, that the clean slate represents a multitude of options, one which is looking at reentry and second chance. We have organizations right in Bridgeport with regards to career resources and being able to help those that are looking to reenter with workplace skills, counseling, and housing. So those are important parts of giving people a second chance. Uh, the other part is looking at erasing the, the criminal record. Uh, we have virtually decriminalized and, and looked to remove marijuana uh, uh, incarceration. That is the post uh, Rockefeller law of, of very, very penal. Uh, drug use laws in this country. Uh, but at the same time, we also looked in housing the last number of years of saying for those that, that need the sense of housing as a foundation that we talked about earlier, for those that are formerly incarcerated would actually have to go through an application process. One of the things that I worked at as a, as a compromise was to not have those formerly incarcerated put it into their applications on a first go. And that the, the landlords obviously could have a second chance or third chance review and background check, but also to hold landlords free of liability so that we can give those that have made mistake and paid their price to society a, a roof over their head and, and to have that sense of a new start. So when we talk about Clean Slate, it's, it's, it's an important initiative that I think we all share to give people a second chance. Now, you always obviously need to understand uh, Governor Malloy and his initiative went beyond looking at the drug offenses and second chance societies in which he really expanded the parole of some violent crimes and potential uh, hardened criminals and gave them early parole. That is a significant difference than what we're talking about, clean slate, people who have paid their debt have been formally incarcerated that need a second chance, I'm all for that. But obviously we need to look at it on a case-by-case -case analysis that there are certain criminals that should never get out and pose a risk to our society and our communities. All right, thank you. We're gonna move on to the next one. This is from Ray McElvey or McKelvey. Regarding the proposed mansion tax on properties valued over $430,000. I feel it puts an excessive burden on average homes in Fairfield County who already pay some of the highest property taxes in the state. Wouldn't it be more equitable to localize the tax based on the median assessed value by town? Where do each of you stand on this issue and how would you vote? All right, I'm going to jump right in. Go ahead. I do not support the proposed mansion tax. 
and I use the word is just a misnomer for uh, an amount for uh, the kind of housing prices that we have prices that we have here in Fairfield and in Fairfield County. The property tax is one of the most aggressive taxes that we have. And we talk a lot about property tax reform, and it's one of the most difficult things to do. You know, one thing that's really important to know is that any legislator can propose any bill in a given session. And there are there are some that, as Senator Wong knows, we're going to have one in our committee. We hear a number of bills that we don't necessarily agree with. But sometimes when our leadership on both sides of the aisle proposes bills, we hear them and have the conversation. I think that, you know, the idea that people have behind some of these, perhaps, although I haven't spoken with them directly, is to look at how do we provide opportunity everywhere in the state. But back to the I don't support that mansion tax. I'm happy to jump on. Also, uh, much to Senator Wong's prior point um, about assuming, I, I was assuming that this was likely directed to Rep. McCarthy Vahey and I, and I also do not support um, this mansion tax. I agree that it's regressive, and I also think that it would serve to hurt the middle class, especially in a community like ours, where uh, assessed home at $430,000 is certainly nowhere near a mansion and quite likely somebody that's doing everything they can to afford to live in a community like ours, likely to be able to send their children to our schools and enjoy the opportunity that comes with living in a community like ours. Um, the piece of the bill that is intriguing, and again, this is certainly not the way I would go about it, but the goal is to better fund our pilot program, which is our payment in lieu of taxes. And Fairfield would very much benefit from a better funded pilot program because we do not um, earn any revenue via taxes for our two universities. And I think as is quite infamous, um, our GE campus now is also not taxable property. And so if we could get payment in lieu of those lost taxes, I, that would benefit our community and likely uh, ease the burden of, of our property taxes. And that is something I'm very much in support of. Uh, and again, not via this, this proposal. So I would just add, and I think the way you read the question, would you also support rejiggering it? And what I would say is flat out, no, not 400,000, 500,000, a million in certain communities or other communities. No, our state struggles with an ability for people to be able to afford to be here. And we have seen proposal after proposal to raise taxes, to fine you if you don't vote, to put in a mileage tax to put in a mileage tax for trucks, to do the mansion tax, to do multiple things. And, you know, we talk about funding our municipalities. You know, our state government continues to spend. And, you know, it's regrettable that in this time when our citizens in the state, by and large, that work for private employers have really been struggling, some to keep their job, some that have lost their job, and state employee workers are getting pay increases. And it, it just doesn't make sense. We had, um, you know, multiple historic sales tax increases in our state, the last of which part of that was go to fund our municipalities. That was separate from pilot because pilot isn't funded. The municipal reimbursement account still has never been distributed to our municipalities. And now we have a second proposal in front of the finance committee to vote on a new pilot program that is going to be funded somehow. So, you know, I think we, the idea of starting with taxing is the wrong way to go. So um, I don't support the mansion tax and I don't support it in any way, shape or form. And I think we need to look at other ways of making our state affordable, particularly for the middle class that are really getting hurt in the state. A absolutely. And it is the middle class that gets hurt because the super wealthy and the governor has said it many, many times. They are so far insulated and they have mobility. It's truly our middle class that we need to be fighting for uh, this kind of proposal as you can see, is an unequivocal no-go from all of us. But here's the problem. When you propose bills like this, when they come either from the speaker or from the, the Senate president, even though it is an idea, the problem is it doesn't go anywhere. But five other states are saying, look, 
They're going to tax you on 400000 They're going to tax you on housing initiatives if you don't meet the moratorium that they're going to take away your education cost. They're going to take away your municipal aid. Again, when we talked about the housing initiatives that was raised earlier, there are bills afoot in the legislature that says, if you do not comply, we are going to use the hammer of a financial withdrawal or financial withholding to your municipality. And for me, when I heard that they were going to use education funding through either construction grants or ECS allocations, those are fighting words for me. That being said, I, I, I think we need to be able to be conscious. And, and, and I'm going to be a simple person. It goes back to the idea that is it a state takeover and dictate of how we run our communities? Or is it a partnership and collaboration with our state and local municipal leadership? It is that simple from that standpoint of a partnership. We are not a county government because in 1960s, we removed ourselves from county government and reinforced a statute that said home rule is foundational to what Connecticut towns and cities are all about. So it, it really is important for us to make a collaboration, as I said earlier, in regards to housing. It needs to be a collaborative input from local, state, and federal initiatives for projects and, 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 and great ideas to work. Very good. Jen, did you, go ahead. I just wanna add one point because I think this becomes a talking point as if Democrats like paying taxes. Nobody likes paying taxes. Nobody wants to pay taxes. They're an investment in our community. And unfortunately in Connecticut, we have had 70 years of digging ourselves into a hole with unfunded pension liabilities. So a full third of Connecticut's operating budget every year goes to debt services and unfunding, unfunded pension liabilities. So that is an issue that makes it very hard to cut spending because we don't want to cut ECS. We don't want to cut pilot and our special transportation fund is already insolvent. There are not a lot of meaty places to look to cut. And we do have these 169 separate little towns that don't want to partner to find efficiencies by and large. And so we really are at a, a real sticking point in where we can go to find solutions to meaningfully make our communities more affordable. And I'm not saying that as if I have the answer, that I think is the rub for many of us on how we can find places to move the needle to make our communities more affordable and continue to invest in them so they are still the very lovely places to live that we like to, to be here. I think actually all four of us, and, and Senator Wong, please forgive me if I'm mistaken, but move to Connecticut from other states. It's a very lovely place to be. Um, and, and so we have, and we do enjoy a, a very lovely quality of life here. Uh, and so it makes cutting hard. Uh, and so I just throw that out there as if it's not just some sort of wasteful spending. 30% is a very, very large percent of our budget that is kind of out of our hands. And I think yeah, that's- I, I think your point's very well taken. And I, I do believe for all four of us up here, we love our town and we love our state. That's why we serve with, with, with all due sincerity. It, it, it really is a, a unique uh, 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 friendship that we have as legislators. That being said, we will have an opportunity, Jennifer, because I will tell you the, the 10 year provision of the CBAC agreement with Governor Malloy that was signed has an opening in this upcoming year where there is a layoff provision, no layoff provision that will be removed. And in fact, the governor put $140 million in his savings in asking for our unions to step up and forfeit their increases while people are losing jobs, people are struggling to keep their businesses. We are looking, and I applaud the governor in that budget initiative, to ask for the CBAC State Employees Union to give back as a concession $140 million. And unfortunately, the State Employees Union says no go. But he has the no layoff provision removed in this upcoming year. And I hope for us as a legislative body that we step up and start attacking the pension liabilities that you talk about, the, 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 the borrowing that we initiate so often of. We finally have an opportunity as a legislative leader 
to step up and say, are we representing the special interest up in Hartford? Or are we going to step up and take the corrective actions that's necessary to ensure financial security for current generations and future generations? We will have an opportunity to vote. I am eager to work together with you to make sure that we step up, say a message on a truly bipartisan basis to say, hey, we need to shape up our government to reflect the, 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 the operations and the challenges of the residents and the taxpayers we represent in Connecticut. When we do that in a unified way, I think we're going to be heading in the right direction. So it's an opportunity, and I'm eager to work together toward that. I would love to respond to that, because when people say that Connecticut never recovered our 2008 pre-recession job numbers, the numbers that we, the jobs we didn't recover are public sector jobs. They're not private sector jobs. That's because Governor Malloy laid off and reduced our state government so much. And so if we're interested in protecting the middle class, these folks are the middle class. And I would also just say, getting many, many emails from people who are unable to get their unemployment payment in a timely manner, it's because there is no workers, at not a, clearly not enough, workers at the Department of Labor. So I would say very much so that the devil's in the details of how we would pursue this. Um, but I also think it's worth noting that our current state employees, if you were hired, I think after 2012 it is, you really don't get much of a pension anymore. It is these old tier one pensions that are mostly folks who are already retired. And there have been, I think, four series of concessions to shave away at those benefits. And again, um, taking a lot of the benefits right off the backs of middle-class workers. But but I'm sure that is a conversation for another day. I'm not even going to enter that conversation because that would take all the rest of our time. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I, think, I, I just want to to make one comment you know um i think where certainly you know all of us want connecticut to be an affordable place where people can stop moving away from because of the cost of living here and i think the governor while there's many aspects of his budget that i think are you know positive in terms of no broad new tax increase i think he really missed an opportunity for structural reform and the only structural reform we have had in decades is what came out of the Republican budget that was adopted by the bipartisan budget in 2017. And that's how we are able to make payments to the pension deficit. Because once the rainy day fund reaches a certain level, right, though that money goes to pay off our pension. So I, I really think that for us to get out of this, we really need to look seriously. I do applaud the governor. He is taking strides to streamline agencies, to modernize agencies and to take some cost out, and it is long overdue. Um, and there's huge opportunity there that I'm sure they're seeing. So I just wanted to throw that in as well. Okay, we're gonna move on to the next question. This is from Pat Riley. House Bill 6440 proposes a simple, transparent, targeted, earn as you grow incentive program for businesses to expand in or relocate to Connecticut. The benefit is earned as jobs are created and maintained over time, mitigating the risk inherent, inherent in traditional economic development approaches. It also directs investment into emerging and focus industries to build upon our strengths of today and develop the ecosystems of tomorrow. Why or why not do you support this proposal? Anybody wanna start? Um, I, I can give it a try. Um, 6440 is actually a proposal that is uh, submitted to the General Assembly to the Commerce Committee um, as a conjunction in conjunction with the governor's budget. And it really was to look at um, creating workforce initiatives, uh, allowing businesses that make the investment in their employees uh, during normal times and especially during these difficult times to be able to give them some tax rebates. And I will offer to you that Democrats and Republican legislators in both sides of the aisle had proposed these kind of initiatives. Um, I'm privy to 6440 because I am part of the governor's workforce uh, 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 skills development uh, task force. And that was one of the major components that we want to empower and enable people and businesses to hire Connecticut residents, develop the skills, and be able to help them succeed. 
Um, we have really looked at apprenticeship initiatives uh, to help them. And I know Jen had talked about the advanced manufacturing. I believe that advanced manufacturing bill resulted from the 2008 uh, uh, crash that we have where we all got together in a true bipartisan uh, fashion and crafted the job bill that still to this day has had a positive lasting effect. And I hope that despite our one party rule dynamic right now, that we can all get together post COVID pandemic, meet the economic challenges that are going to be so big of a burden for all of us. We really need to get together and, and solve these problems because single party rule, doesn't work. We need to all step up and be united in how we resolve these issues. But 6440 is one of the positive aspects of the governor's bill in looking at creating and empowering our workforce development. I'm embarrassed to say I actually knew that. Does There's way too else? many things going on in the General Assembly. Does anyone else want to comment? I Support, oh, go ahead, Dr. support jobs in the state of Connecticut, I think is great. Um, this has not come before me. Honestly, I haven't, I did read a snippet of it in the Office of Fiscal Analysis review of the governor's budget, um, but I'm not deeply familiar with the program. So I appreciate hearing from Senator Wong. I was just going to add, I think that this bill is up in the Commerce Committee for public hearing next, yes, um, next week. Uh, uh, next week, maybe tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but I just will second what Rep. Devlin said. Whatever we can do to incentivize businesses to come here and 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 more so even than that to stay and to grow here. Because I think what we want to avoid is offering tax incentives for businesses to come here. And then when their, um, their benefit expires, they shop to the next state. We want to be incentivizing companies to come, but stay and grow. And so whatever we can do in that regard, I'm very supportive of. And I would just add uh, 100% business retention is number one. It's a lot easier to keep a business here than it is to try and attract a new one. Um, I have not read this proposal, but I think the efforts that the governor has made with the workforce development and um, our business development have been tremendous. And I think back to the idea of there isn't one solution, this is one. Um, a couple of the others that I've been excited to be a part of over the years and hoping we can move the needle on are employee stock ownership plans and worker cooperatives, which help uh, do business wealth building, right? So we talk about home ownership as a way of wealth building, um, employee stock ownership as a way to transition companies that may have uh, be a family business and that are looking to sell and might sell to some out of state corporation could instead be owned by the workers. And so that's one, um, one piece, <clears throat> excuse me. And the other piece in terms of helping our workers and our businesses is an exciting new opportunity uh, that I've learned about recently from a Fairfield resident, which is micro credentials and how we can use those to help our businesses gain help workers gain the skills that they need for businesses because we have especially in southeastern connecticut where we have electric boat and the submarine force uh, development we have a lot of jobs that need people with the right skills so it's it's a menu of things and we've got to be looking at all of those okay thank you we're going to move to the next question this is from barbara thumb Regarding legalization of medical marijuana, have guidelines been established for who can use, how, who, where to sell and use, what to do about those previously arrested for possession and use, and estimated revenues? And what is your position? Anybody can start. I'll, how about I'll start with that one, actually, since I, okay. I ended with the other one. Um, I actually was probably in the middle of the night last night uh, emailing back and forth with some folks from the governor's office. I have not gone um, deep into the policy with this, but what I can say is I have an interesting perspective as the co-chair of Fearful Cares here in the community. And one of the biggest concerns that I have is just to look at youth prevention and I want to be sure that anything that we do in terms of legalizing marijuana, just to clarify, medical marijuana is legal already. So I think um, you, she was probably referring to uh, legalizing marijuana at large. 
And the other issue that we talk about a lot is uh, traffic safety. And I've learned a lot from the Department of Transportation in this regard in terms of the kind of training and behavioral health analysis that we're going to need to provide both to our state troopers, but to all of our local police departments. And this would apply not just to marijuana, but to a lot of other substances. And given what we know in terms of the increase in overdoses and opioid use, this kind of training would be really valuable going forward. So I, as I said, have been in conversation and I'm going to remain so to try and uh, talk with folks who are proponents of this bill to be sure that there are safeguards in place for us as we move forward. But I'm still having those conversations. Anyone else? Yeah. Um it's important to have a policy perspective when you look at legalization of marijuana, regardless of the merits of it. Um, if you're looking to legalize marijuana for budgetary and financial purposes, it's wrong because it is a much more in-depth societal concern that we need to understand. And when you look at, at this country and in this state and this town and neighborhoods impacted by opiate and, and substance abuse in our communities, you realize that uh, to this day, marijuana is still a class two narcotic in, in this country. So we, we need to tread very carefully. And, and if we're doing it for money, it's the wrong way. We should look at the socioeconomic as well as ramifications in regards to what uh, Representative McCarthy Vey said, law enforcement and, and youth prevention. But what I ask most important of all is a level of consistency. I, I, I find it very frustrating that in the General Assembly that we have moved very aggressively and rightfully to now ban vaping for, for children under 21, to now look to remove flavor as well as uh, menthol in regards to the lure of having younger generations be potentially addicted to tobacco and vaping. But at the same time, we're saying, yeah, let's legalize marijuana. There's an inconsistency in that policy that I work very hard to try to point out. If you're going to ban vaping, if you're going to ban tobacco because you want to protect a, a future potential generation of being addicted to it, then you should not be looking to legalize marijuana. So I ask for a level of consistency, but also recognition that when we make that permissiveness and the, the argument used that every other state around us is doing it is not good enough for me. That also applies to legalize online and sports gambling. We need in the state of Connecticut to maintain that delicate balance and the responsibility that we have as policymakers to do the right thing and to be consistent in our policymaking. I'm happy to add my two cents to that. I really align with what Senator Wong said. And I think the governor has learned this proposal has come up before. And from what I understand, and I haven't seen the legislation, there is a public hearing on Friday, one of two big public hearings that will be taking place on that day. Um, there's a lot of focus on lots of different aspects of it, lots of focus on equity, um, ensuring that a lot of the retail locations would be in areas that traditionally have been targeted in terms of drug abuse or arrests. Um, there's going to be a lot of carrots for municipalities uh, that, hey, we're going to take this money, we'll fund pilot. We're going to take this money, we're going to give it back to you and relieve your property taxes. So I don't know that that's the right policy decision. Um, we heard this summer the Speaker of the House saying, I support this and it's not revenue. It is not for revenue. I would not support it for revenue. And the governor is bringing this out for revenue. So I think I look forward to the discussions on this. It'll be a big issue this session. Um, I'm happy just to add a few thoughts. Legalization has never been a big passion issue of mine, but it has very, very broad public support. I agree that this is an issue where maybe more than almost anything, the devil's in the details in the sense that we need to make sure we get it right and that we are ensuring that it is safe for only the right people and certainly not our young people and certainly not driving under the influence and all of those very, very important laws. But I also think about it from a safety perspective in the sense that 
I would say that marijuana use is almost ubiquitous. And if this is an opportunity to get it out of the shadows and out of the black market and, and regulated to be a safer product that we know people are using, then we could actually have an opportunity to increase safety here. And a very much to Senator Wong's point with the opioid um, crisis, often people are getting things that are very different than what they thought they were getting. And, and this could be an opportunity to prevent a lot of that. Uh, of course, not legalizing opioids, but I think we've seen cases where people were purchasing marijuana that was laced with things. And that's, that's very, very dangerous. Um, so if there's an opportunity to make sure what is available is safer for folks. I, I think that's great. And then, you know, I was driving up 91 the other day and there are enormous billboards telling people just come over to Massachusetts to buy your marijuana here. So if that's the case, people are just leaving the state to spend their money to buy marijuana legally in other places. Um, I think I think we need to wrestle with the reality that that people are are using marijuana products and and we want to make sure that they're getting them safely here in our state and also might as well get the revenue and and perhaps it could be a win-win as long as there are the appropriate um, regulations and, and safety uh, parameters around it. And Bryce, if I may, you know, wearing, wearing my prevention hat, um, I just need to say very clearly and unequivocally, marijuana legalization would be for 21 and older. No marijuana use is safe for a developing brain. And that is a clear and unequivocal message. The Tobacco 21 legislation was, again, to prevent our youth and young adults under age 21. So I just want to be clear that uh, that's an important message and something that we see, which is that students and parents have a lower perception of harm. That's been happening over a period of a number of years prior to the legalization conversation here in Connecticut. And that's why if there is legislation that's passed, it's critical that there's money invested in education and awareness so that it's very clear this is 21 and older and youth is not helped. Thank you. We have time for one last question and this this can be a short one. I, I took out some of the some of the other. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this is from Jonathan Elkind. How about exploring the possibility of a town pool facility in a corner of the Jennings Beach parking lot? There's plenty of space and the only day it's full is July 4th. Um, if I may begin, that is one of my neighbors and I'm so thrilled to hear the question. Some, I'm sure many folks recall years ago, there was a conversation about a town pool and a number of residents uh, led by my predecessor, actually, uh, Representative Kim Fawcett. And what I would say is that's one of those great issues where the our municipality, our local government, really um, can be supported over time if that was something that the community would want. So that's one of the things that our local parks and rec is actually going to be undergoing a, a study to look at utilization. It's certainly something that I've heard about on and off over the years. Um, I, but I would say for that one, I'm gonna stay in my lane as a state rep. If the town were to come to us and ask for support on that, I would be behind it 100%. Well, it's an opportunity for me to acknowledge the really great resources and, and the quality of, of our facilities, of our town's parks and recreational facilities. Uh, so I want to give a shout out to them. That being said, I, I would welcome anything that would enhance the quality of life uh, that is manageable within our, our funding and tax structure. Uh, but I, I guess I can end this. Boy, do I wish that we could go back to the days of going swimming in a public beach. Um, and and I, hope, I hope we have that soon. Um, COVID fatigue is very real. And I, I want to give a shout out to all the people out there that have worn their masks, practice hygiene, and do all the necessary things to protect themselves, their loved ones, and the people that they interact with. Uh, we are not um, one of the lowest uh, potential infection rates in the, in the state of Connecticut by accident. We have great, great uh, uh, outreach efforts as part of our uh, first select women's efforts, but also the people. The people have demonstrated that they take this seriously 
and they respect and offer the courtesy to others. So, boy, but I wish I could go back and go swimming in a public pool. Hey, not to weigh in on should we, shouldn't we, I will just say that where I grew up, I learned to swim at our Lions Club pool and our community pool uh, became a source of a job for me and many people in our community. It was run by our Parks and Rec and provided employment for us when we were younger. I taught swimming lessons. I was a lifeguard. I worked concessions. Um, I am pro pool, but uh, that's a local decision. So I will look to the community to see how everybody feels. I guess I would just say ditto to that. I have two little boys who I would love to take to a community pool. I guess we are also really lucky to have the beaches and Lake Mohegan. Um, but if the community was behind a pool, I would be uh, right there with them 100%. Well, thank you. And thank you all for being here. You're you're always wonderful. I, I, we appreciate it as a league. Um, you've always been very responsive. And I really want to thank all um, the public that submitted all these fabulous questions. I mean, they were very thought provo provoking, well-researched, well-written, so uh, thank you. I wanna make a note that coming up in March, in honor of Women's History Month, the League and the Museum are partnering again to present Denise Merrill in Making Democracy Work, a conversation with the Secretary of the State. This virtual presentation will be held March 10th from 1 to 2 p.m. So look for more information in the next week or so, and we hope you'll join us then too. Thank you all again. My my applause to you. I wish more people could be here and you could hear Thank us. You, <laughs> Thank you and good night. Be safe. Thank you. Thanks, Bryce. Good night. Stay healthy. Be safe. Thanks, Bryce. Bye-bye.